Babism Persian, Baby Babaye, also known as the Bayani faith, Persian, Bayani Bayani, is an Abrahamic monotheistic religion which professes that there is one incorporeal, unknown, and incomprehensible God who manifests his will in an unending series of theophanies, called Manifestations of God Arabic. It has no more than a few thousand adherents according to current estimates, most of whom are concentrated in Iran. It was founded by Ali Muhammad Shirazi who first assumed the title of Bab lit. Gate from which the religion gets its name, out of the belief that he was the gate to the twelfth imam. However throughout his ministry his titles and claims underwent much evolution as the Bab progressively outlined his teachings. Founded in 1844, Babism flourished in Persia until 1852, then lingered on in exile in the Ottoman Empire, especially Cyprus, as well as underground. An anomaly amongst Islamic messianic movements, the Babi movement signaled a break with Islam, beginning a new religious system with its own unique laws, teachings, and practices. While Babism was violently opposed by both clerical and government establishments, it led to the founding of the Baha'i Faith, whose followers consider the religion founded by the Bab as a predecessor to their own. Etymology <inaudible> 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 Babism, a term originating from Orientalists rather than the followers of the religion, comes from the Perso-Arabic noun bab Arabic, bab meaning gate. Additionally, bayani comes from the triliteral root byn which forms a class of words relating to concepts of clarity, differentiation, and separation, including bayan which can refer to explanation, commentary, or exposition as well as the branch of Arabic rhetoric dealing with metaphors and interpretation. Beliefs and teachings The Bab's teachings can be grouped into three broad stages which each have a dominant thematic focus. His earliest teachings are primarily defined by his interpretation of the Quran and other Islamic traditions. While this interpretive mode continues throughout all three stages of his teachings, a shift takes place where his emphasis moves to the philosophical elucidation and finally to legislative pronouncements. In the second philosophical stage, the Bab gives an explanation of the metaphysics of being and creation, and in the third legislative stage his mystical and historical principles are explicitly united. An analysis of the Bab's writings throughout the three stages shows that all of his teachings were animated by a common principle that had multiple dimensions and forms. Hidden Imam. In Twelver Shia Islamic belief there were twelve Imams, the last of which, known as Imam Mahdi, who communicated with his followers only through certain representatives. According to the Twelver's belief, after the last of these representatives died, the Imam Mahdi went into a state of occultation, while still alive, he was no longer accessible to his believers. Shia Muslims believe that when the world becomes oppressed, the Imam Mahdi also termed the Qaim will come out of occultation and restore true religion on earth before the cataclysmic end of the world and Judgment Day. In Babi belief the Bab is the return of the Imam Mahdi, but the doctrine of the occultation is implicitly denied, instead the Bab stated that his manifestation was a symbolic return of the Imam, and not the physical reappearance of the Imam Mahdi who had died a thousand years earlier. In Babi belief the statements made from previous revelations regarding the Imam Mahdi were set forth in symbols. The Bab also stated that he was not only the fulfillment of the Shi'i expectations for the Qayyim, but that he also was the beginning of a new prophetic dispensation. <laughs> Resurrection, Judgment Day and Cyclical Revelation The Bab taught that his revelation was beginning an apocalyptic process that was bringing the Islamic dispensation to its cyclical end, and starting a new dispensation. He taught that the terms, resurrection, judgment day, paradise, and hell, used in Shia prophecies for the end times are symbolic. He stated that, resurrection, means that the appearance of a new revelation, and that, raising of the dead means the spiritual awakening of those who have stepped away from true religion. He further stated that, "...judgment day," refers to when a new manifestation of God comes, and the acceptance or rejection of those on the earth. 
Thus the Bab taught that with his revelation the end times ended and the age of resurrection had started and that the end times were symbolic as the end of the past prophetic cycle. In the Persian Bayan, the Bab wrote that religious dispensations come in cycles, as the seasons, to renew pure religion for humanity. This notion of continuity anticipated future prophetic revelations after the Bab. He whom God shall make manifest While the Bab claimed a station of revelation, he also claimed no finality for his revelation. One of the core Babi teachings is the great promised one, whom the Bab termed he whom God shall make manifest, promised in the sacred writings of previous religions would soon establish the kingdom of God on the earth. In the books written by the Bab he constantly entreats his believers to follow he whom God shall make manifest when he arrives and not behave like the Muslims who have not accepted his own revelation. Religious law The Bab abrogated Islamic law and in the Persian Bayan promulgated a system of Babi law, thus establishing a separate religion distinct from Islam. Some of the new laws included changing the direction of the Qibla to the Bab's house in Shiraz, Iran and changing the calendar to a solar calendar of 19 months and 19 days which became the basis of the Baha'i calendar and prescribing the last month as a month of fasting. The Bab also created a large number of rituals and rites which remained largely unpracticed. Some of these rituals include the carrying of arms only in times of necessity, the obligatory sitting on chairs, the advocating of the cleanliness displayed by Christians, the non-cruel treatment of animals, the prohibition of beating children severely, the recommendation of the printing of books, even scripture and the prohibition on the study of logic or dead languages. While some statements in the Bayan show tolerance, there are other very harsh regulations in regards to relations with non-believers. For example, non-believers are forbidden to live in five central Iranian provinces, the holy places of previous religions are to be demolished, all non-Babi books should be destroyed, believers are not to marry or sit in the company of non-believers, and the property of non-believers can be taken from them. Some further ritual include elaborate regulations regarding pilgrimage, fasting, the manufacture of rings, the use of perfume, and the washing and disposal of the dead. History <inaudible> <inaudible> Antecedents Twelver Shi'i Muslims regard the twelfth Imam, Muhammad al-Mahdi, as the last of the Imams. They contend that Muhammad al-Mahdi went into the occultation in 874 CE, at which time communication between the Imam and the Muslim community could only be performed through mediators called Babs gates, or Naibs representatives. In 940, the fourth Naib claimed that Imam Muhammad al-Mahdi had gone into an indefinite grand occultation, and that he would cease to communicate with the people. According to Twelver belief, the hidden Imam is alive in the world, but in concealment from his enemies, and that he would only emerge shortly before the Last Judgment. At that time, acting as al qaim he who will arise, a messianic figure also known as the Mahdi, he who is rightly guided, the hidden Imam would start a holy war against evil, would defeat the unbelievers, and would start a reign of justice. In 1830s Qajar Persia, Sayyid Qazim Rashti was the leader of the Shaykhis, a sect of Twelvers. The Shaykhis were a group expecting the imminent appearance of Al-Qu'im. At the time of Qazim's death in 1843, he had counseled his followers to leave their homes to seek the Lord of the Age whose advent would soon break on the world. Origin <inaudible> 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 On the 22nd of May 1844 Mullah Hussain of Bashriya in Khorasan, a prominent disciple of Sayyid Qazim, entered Shiraz following the instruction by his master to search for al qaim Soon after he arrived in Shiraz, Mullah Hussain came into contact with the Bab. On the night of May 22, 1844, Mullah Hussain was invited by the Bab to his home. On that night Mullah Hussain told him that he was searching for the possible successor to Sayyid Qazim, al qaim and the Bab told Mullah Hussain privately that he was Sayyid Qazim's successor and the bearer of divine knowledge. 
Through the night of the 22nd to dawn of the 23rd, Mullah Hussein became the first to accept the Bab's claims as the gateway to truth and the initiator of a new prophetic cycle. The Bab had replied in a satisfactory way to all of Mullah Hussein's questions and had written in his presence, with extreme rapidity, a long commentary on the Surah of Yusuf, which has come to be known as the Qayyumu el Asma and is often considered the Bab's first revealed work, though he had before then composed a commentary on Surat al Fatiha and Surat al Baqarah. This night and the following day are observed in the Baha'i faith as a holy day since then. After Mullah Hussein accepted the Bab's claim, the Bab ordered him to wait until 17 others had independently recognized the station of the Bab before they could begin teaching others about the new revelation. Within five months, 17 other disciples of Sayyid Qazim had independently recognized the Bab as a manifestation of God. Among them was one woman, Zaran Taj Baragani, a poet, who later received the name of Tahira, the pure. These eighteen disciples were later to be known as the Letters of the Living and were given the task of spreading the new faith across Iran and Iraq. The Bab emphasized the spiritual station of these eighteen individuals, who along with himself, made the first unity of his religion. After his declaration, he soon assumed the title of the Bab. Within a few years the movement spread all over Iran, causing controversy. His claim was at first understood by some of the public at the time to be merely a reference to the gate of the hidden Imam of Muhammad, but this understanding he publicly disclaimed. He later proclaimed himself, in the presence of the heir to the throne of Persia and other notables, to be al qaim In the Bab's writings, the Bab appears to identify himself as the gate Bab to Muhammad al-Mahdi and later he begins to explicitly proclaim his station as equivalent to that of the hidden Imam and a new messenger from God. Sayyidi states the exalted identity the Bab was claiming was unmistakable, but due to the reception of the people, his writings appear to convey the impression that he is only the gate to the hidden twelfth Imam. To his circle of early believers, the Bab was equivocal about his exact status, gradually confiding in them that he was not merely a gate to the hidden Imam, but the manifestation of the hidden Imam and al qaim himself. During his early meetings with Mullah Hussein, the Bab described himself as the master and the promised one. He did not consider himself just Sayyid Qazim Rashti's successor, but claimed a prophetic status, with a sense of deputyship delegated to him not just from the hidden Imam, but from divine authority. His early texts, such as the commentary on the Surah of Yusuf, used Quranic language that implied divine authority and identified himself effectively with the Imam. When Mullah Ali Bastami, the second letter of the living, was put on trial in Baghdad for preaching about the Bab, the clerics studied the commentary on the Surah of Yusuf, recognized in it a claim to divine revelation, and quoted from it extensively to prove that the author had made a messianic claim. <laughs> Spread The Bab's message was disseminated by the letters of the living through Iran and southern Iraq. One of these initial activities were communicated to the West starting January 8, 1845 as an exchange of diplomatic reports concerning the fate of Mullah Ali e Bastami, the second letter. These were exchanges between Sir Henry Rawlinson, 1st Baronet who wrote first to Stratford Canning, 1st Viscount Stratford de Redcliffe. Follow-ups continued until in 1846 he was sentenced by the Ottomans to serve in the naval shipyards at hard labor. The Ottoman ruler refusing to banish him as it would be difficult to control his activities and prevent him spreading his false ideas. Kudus and other early followers then were sent on to Shiraz to begin public presentations of the new religion. Indeed various activities the Bab initiated were devolved to various letters of the living like preaching activities and answering questions from the community. In particular as these first public activities multiplied opposition by the Islamic clergy arose and prompted the governor of Shiraz to order the Bab's arrest. The Bab, upon hearing of the arrest order, left Busha for Shiraz in June 1845 and presented himself to the authorities. This series of events become the first public account of the new religion in the West when they were published November 1, 1845 in The Times. The story was also carried from November 15 by the Literary Gazette which was subsequently echoed widely. The Bab was placed under house arrest at the home of his uncle, and was restricted in his personal activities, until a cholera epidemic broke out in the city in September 1846, the Bab was released and departed for Isfahan. There, many came to see him at the house of the Imam Juma, head of the local clergy, who became sympathetic. 
After an informal gathering where the Bab debated the local clergy and displayed his speed in producing instantaneous verses, his popularity soared. After the death of the governor of Isfahan, Manocher Khan Gorgi, an Iranian Georgian, who had become his supporter, pressure from the clergy of the province led to the Shah, Muhammad Shah Qajar, ordering the Bab to Tehran in January, 1847. After spending several months in a camp outside Tehran, and before the Bab could meet the Shah, the Prime Minister sent the Bab to Tabriz in the northwestern corner of the country, and later Maku and Cherik, where he was confined. During his confinement, he was said to have impressed his jailers with his patience and dignity. Communication between the Bab and his followers was not completely severed but was quite difficult, and more responsibilities were devolved to the letters as he was not able to elucidate his teachings to the public. With Babi teachings now mostly spread by his followers, they faced increasing persecution themselves. The role played by Tahira in Karbal was particularly significant. She began an effort of innovation in religion based on her station as a letter of the living and the incarnation of Fatima. In his early teachings, the Bab emphasized observing sharia and extraordinary acts of piety. However, his claim of being the Bab, i.e. the authority direct from God, was in conflict with this more conservative position of supporting sharia. Tahira innovated an advance in the understanding of the priority of the Bab's station above that of Islamic Sharia by wedding the concept of the Bab's overriding religious authority with ideas originating in Sheikhism pointing to an age after outward conformity. She seems to have made this connection circa 1262-1846 even before the Bab himself. The matter was taken up by the community at large at the Conference of Badasht. This conference was one of the most important events of the Babi movement when in 1848 its split from Islam and Islamic law was made clear. Three key individuals who attended the conference were Baha'u'llah, Qudus, and Tahira. Tahira, during the conference, was able to persuade many of the others about the Babi split with Islam based on the station of the Bab and an age after outward conformity. She appeared at least once during the conference in public without a veil, heresy within the Islamic world of that day, signaling the split. During this same month the Bab was brought to trial in Tabriz and made his claim to be the Mahdi public to the Crown Prince and the Shia clergy. Several sources agree that by 1848 or 1850 there were 100,000 converts to Babism. In the fall of 1850 newspaper coverage fell behind quickly unfolding events. Though the Bab was named for the first time he had in fact already been executed. <inaudible> Uprisings and massacres By 1848 the increased fervor of the Babis and the clerical opposition had led to a number of confrontations between the Babis and their government and clerical establishment. After the death of Muhammad Shah Qajar, the Shah of Iran, a series of armed struggles and uprisings broke out in the country, including at Tabarsi. These confrontations all resulted in Babi massacres. Baha'i authors give an estimate of 20,000 Babis killed from 1844 to present, with most of the deaths occurring during the first 20 years. Former professor of Islamic studies Dennis Maiswan studied documented deaths, both for individuals and for round figures, from Babi, Baha'i, European, and Iranian sources, and confirmed at most two to three thousand. He stated that he could not find evidence for any higher figures. Supporters of the Babis paint their struggle as basically defensive in nature, Shi'i writers on the other hand point to this period as proof of the subversive nature of Babism. Maiswan has pointed out that the Babis did arm themselves, upon the Babs' instructions, and originally intended an uprising, but that their eventual clashes with state forces were defensive, and not considered an offensive jihad. In mid-1850 a new prime minister, Amir Kabir, was convinced that the Babi movement was a threat and ordered the execution of the Bab which was followed by the killings of many Babis. Fort Tabarsi. Of the conflicts between the Babis and the establishment, the first and best known took place in Mazandaran at the remote shrine of Sheikh Tabarsi, about 22 km southeast of Barfarish modern Babel. From October 1848 until May 1849, around 300 Babis later rising to 600, led by Kudus and Mullah Hussein, defended themselves against the attacks of local villagers and members of the Shah's army under the command of Prince Mahdi Kali Mirza. They were, after being weakened through attrition and starvation, subdued through false promises of safety, and put to death or sold into slavery. 
Topic: Zanjan upheaval. The revolt at the fortress of Ali Mardin Khan in Zanjan in northwest Iran was by far the most violent of all the conflicts. It was headed by Mullah Muhammad Ali Zanjani, called Hujat, and also lasted seven or eight months May 1850 to January 1851. The Babi community in the city had swelled to around 3,000 after the conversion of one of the town's religious leaders to the Babi movement. The conflict was preceded by years of growing tension between the leading Islamic clergy and the new rising Babi leadership. The city governor ordered that the city be divided into two sectors, with hostilities starting soon thereafter. The Babis faced resistance against a large number of regular troops, and led to the death of several thousand Babis. After Hujat was killed, and the Babi numbers being greatly reduced, the Babis surrendered in January 1851 and were massacred by the army. Nehra's upheaval Meanwhile, a serious but less protracted struggle was waged against the government at Nairiz in Fars by Yahya Vahid Darabi of Nairiz. Vahid had converted around 1500 people in the community and had thus caused tensions with the authorities which led to an armed struggle in a nearby fort. The Babis resisted attacks by the town's governor as well as further reinforcements. After being given a truce offer on 17 June 1850, Vahid told his followers to give up their positions, which led to Vahid and the Babis being killed. The Babi section of the town was also plundered, and the property of the remaining Babis seized. Later, in March 1853, the governor of the city was killed by the Babis. These further events led to a second armed conflict near the city where the Babis once again resisted troop attacks until November 1853, when a massacre of Babis happened, with their women being enslaved. <laughs> After the execution of the Bab The revolts in Zanjan and Nairiz were in progress when in 1850 the Bab, with one of his disciples, was brought from his prison at Cherik to Tabriz and publicly shot in front of the citadel. The body, after being exposed for some days, was recovered by the Babis and conveyed to a shrine near Tehran, whence it was ultimately removed to Haifa, where it is now enshrined. Most Western scholars who reviewed the faith of the Bab after 1860 saw it as a way of letting in Western and Christian ideals into a closed and rigid Muslim system and giving the Bab himself sometimes less or more credit for being authentic in the process. However some went further. In 1866 British diplomat Robert Grant Watson b. 8 February 1834, d. 28 October 1892 published a history of the first 58 years of the 19th century of Persia and would serve in several diplomatic capacities Watson summarizes the impact of the Bab in Persia. Babism, though at present a proscribed religion in Persia, is far from being extinct, or even declining, and the Bab may yet contest with Mahomed sick the privilege of being regarded as the real prophet of the faithful. Babism in its infancy was the cause of a greater sensation than that even which was produced by the teaching of Jesus, if we may judge from the account of Josephus of the first days of Christianity. Latter commentators also noted these kinds of views, Ernest Renan, Stephen Greenleaf Bullfinch, son of Charles Bullfinch, and others, for the next two years comparatively little was heard of the Babis. The Babis became polarized with one group speaking of violent retribution against Nasser al-Din Shah Qajar, while the other, under the leadership of Baha'u'llah, looked to rebuild relationships with the government and advance the Babi cause by persuasion and the example of virtuous living. The militant group of Babis was between 30 and 70 persons, only a small number of the total Babi population of perhaps 100,000. Their meetings appear to have come under the control of a Hussein Jan an emotive and magnetic figure who obtained a high degree of personal devotion to himself from the group. Meanwhile Tahira and Baha'u'llah, visible leaders of the community previously, were removed from the scene, Tahira by arrest and in the case of Baha'u'llah an invitation to go on pilgrimage to Karbila. On August 15, 1852, three from this small splinter group, acting on their own initiative, attempted to assassinate Nasser al-Din Shah Qajar as he was returning from the chase to his palace at Nyavarin. Notwithstanding the assassins' claim that they were working alone, the entire Babi community was blamed, and a slaughter of several thousand Babis followed, starting on 31 August 1852 with some 30 Babis, including Tahira. 
Dr. Jakob Eduard Polak, then the Shah's physician, was an eye witness to her execution. Bahá'u'lláh surrendered himself and he along with a few others were imprisoned in the Siashal, Black Pit, an underground dungeon in Tehran. Meanwhile echoes of the newspaper coverage of the violence continued into 1853. <laughs> <laughs> Succession In most of his prominent writings, the Bab alluded to a promised one, most commonly referred to as he whom God shall make manifest, and that he himself was but a ring upon the hand of him whom God shall make manifest. Within twenty years of the Bab's death, over twenty-five people claimed to be the promised one, most significantly Baha'u'llah. Shortly before the Bab's execution, a follower of the Bab, Abd al-Karim, brought to the Bab's attention the necessity to appoint a successor, thus the Bab wrote a certain number of tablets which he gave to Abd al-Karim to deliver to Subai Azal and Baha'u'llah. These tablets were later interpreted by both Azalis and Baha'is as proof of the Bab's delegation of leadership. Some sources state that the Bab did this at the suggestion of Baha'u'llah. In one of the tablets, which is commonly referred to as the Will and Testament of the Bab, Subai Azal is viewed to have been appointed as leader of the Babis after the death of the movement's founder. The tablet, in verse 27, orders Subai Azal. Less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 to obey him whom God shall make manifest. At the time of the apparent appointment Subai Azal was still a teenager, had never demonstrated leadership in the Babi movement, and was still living in the house of his older brother, Baha'u'llah. All of this lends credence to the Baha'i claim that the Bab appointed Subai Azal the head of the Babi faith so as to divert attention away from Baha'u'llah, while allowing Babis to visit Baha'u'llah and consult with him freely, and allowing Baha'u'llah to write Babis easily and freely. Subai Azal's leadership was controversial. He generally absented himself from the Babi community spending his time in Baghdad in hiding and disguise, and even went so far as to publicly disavow allegiance to the Bab on several occasions. Subai Azal gradually alienated himself from a large proportion of the Babis who started to give their alliance to other claimants. During the time that both Baha'u'llah and Subai Azal were in Baghdad, since Subai Azal remained in hiding, Baha'u'llah performed much of the daily administration of the Babi affairs. Baha'u'llah claimed that in 1853, while a prisoner in Tehran, he was visited by a maid of heaven, which symbolically marked the beginning of his mission as a messenger of God. Ten years later in Baghdad, he made his first public declaration to be he whom God shall make manifest to a small number of followers, and in 1866 he made the claim public. Baha'u'llah's claims threatened Subai Azal's position as leader of the religion since it would mean little to be leader of the Babis if him whom God shall make manifest were to appear and start a new religion. Subai Azal responded by making his own claims, but his attempt to preserve the traditional Babism was largely unpopular, and his followers became the minority. Eventually Baha'u'llah was recognized by the vast majority of Babis as, He whom God shall make manifest, and his followers began calling themselves Baha'is. By 1908, there were probably from half a million to a million Baha'is, and at most only a hundred followers of Subai Azal. Subai Azal died in Famagusta, Cyprus in 1912, and his followers are known as Azalis or Azali Babis. Maswan notes that after the deaths of those Azali Babis who were active in the Persian Constitutional Revolution, the Azali form of Babism entered a stagnation from which it has not recovered as there is no acknowledged leader or central organization. Current estimates of Azalis are that there are no more than a few thousand. The World Religion Database estimated 7.3 million Baha'is in 2010 and stated, the Baha'i faith is the only religion to have grown faster in every United Nations region over the past 100 years than the general population. Baha'i was thus the fastest growing religion between 1910 and 2010, growing at least twice as fast as the population of almost every UN region. Baha'i sources since 1991 usually estimate the worldwide Baha'i population at above 5 million. See Baha'i statistics. Writings See also writings of the Bab. The Bab's major writings include the Qayyumul Asma, a commentary on the Surah of Joseph, and the Persian Bayan, which the Babis saw as superseding the Quran. The latter has been translated into French, only portions exist in English. 
Unfortunately, most of the writings of the Bab have been lost. The Bab himself stated they exceeded 500,000 verses in length. The Quran, in contrast, is 6,300 verses in length. If one assumes 25 verses per page, that would equal 20,000 pages of text. Nabil i Zarandi, in the Dawn Breakers, mentions nine complete commentaries on the Quran, revealed during the Bab's imprisonment at Maku, which have been lost without a trace. Establishing the true text of the works that are still extant, as already noted, is not always easy, and some texts will require considerable work. Others, however, are in good shape. Several of the Bab's major works are available in the handwriting of his trusted secretaries. Most works were revealed in response to specific questions by Babas. This is not unusual, the genre of the letter has been a venerable medium for composing authoritative texts as far back as Paul of Tarsus. Three quarters of the chapters of the New Testament are letters, were composed to imitate letters, or contain letters within them. Sometimes the Bab revealed works very rapidly by chanting them in the presence of a secretary and witnesses. The Archives Department at the Baha'i World Center currently holds about 190 tablets of the Bab. Excerpts from several principal works have been published in the only English-language compilation of the Bab's writings, selections from the writings of the Bab. Dennis Maswan, in his Sources for Early Babi Doctrine and History, gives a description of many works. Much of the following summary is derived from that source. In addition to major works, the Bab revealed numerous letters to his wife and followers, many prayers for various purposes, numerous commentaries on verses or chapters of the Quran, and many cutbys or sermons, most of which were never delivered. Many of these have been lost, others have survived in compilations. Criticism Dennis Maswan considers Babi law as a mishmash of rules and regulations that at times are little more than mere whimsy, revolving around some of the Bab's own obsessions about cleanliness, polite behavior, and elegance. It is a sharia, but not in any practical sense. Certainly, it does not seem to be going anywhere. Here and there we find indications that the Bab had been impressed by Europeans and that he wanted his followers to emulate them. He further states, One comes away from the Bayan with a strong sense that very little of this is to be taken seriously. It is a form of a game, never actually intended to be put into practice, much in the same way that whole sections of the Bab's later books don't, in fact, mean anything very much, but are elaborate exercises in interesting things you can do with Arabic roots. Or the way so many of the Bab's early writings, described as tafsirs on this or that surah of the Quran, are really not commentaries at all." He further criticizes the Babi laws stating, the average Babi could hardly hope to afford the three diamonds, four yellow rubies, six emeralds, and six red rubies that he was expected to give to the Babi Messiah, let alone find time to observe all the rules and regulations laid down in the book. For all that, the Babi Sharia made an impact. Nader Saidi states that the severe laws of the Bayan were never meant to be put in practice, because their implementation depended on the appearance of he whom God shall make manifest, while at the same time all of the laws would be abrogated unless the promised one would reaffirm them. Saidi concludes that these can then only have a strategic and symbolic meaning, and were meant to break through traditions and to focus the Bab's followers on obedience to he whom God shall make manifest. Topic. See also Babism portal Azalis Baha'i faith Persian Bayan Selections from the writings of the Bab